Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings a message of hope in Jesus Christ. Good morning, church family. Um, we're glad to have you all with us today. Uh, my name is Vainant, and this is my beautiful wife, Hannah Grace. And um, yeah, we've been coming here for over a year and a half now and been members since uh, last spring. The scripture for this week's um, Advent devotional is in Luke 2, 4 through 7. And it says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Today we are lighting the candle for faith. As you read in our Advent guides last week, many years ago, a promise was given to Adam and Eve that despite their obedience, God would be merciful. This week, our guides will show us um, how God, in fact, kept that promise hundreds of years ago. If you'll all bow your heads and pray with us. Father God, thank you so much for this day that we have to come and gather with fellow believers and to learn about your word and just be encouraged and challenged. Father, thank you for fulfilling your promise of sending your son for the redemption of our sins so that you've made a way that we can um, know you and have a relationship with you. I pray that during this busy season that we'll slow down and meditate on your word and your promises and your faithfulness and just be reminded of your character. I pray that you would um, help us have joy and um, just keep our focus on you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I, and I do hope you do, let's take them out. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John, chapter 10. Our text begins in verse 22. This text in verse 22 of John, chapter 10, uh, draws to a conclusion the section that we began in chapter 7. Uh, it's appropriate timing for us to look at this particular text, beginning in verse 22, because of the time on the calendar because of when this text takes place. We ended our text last week at verse 21. It was a, if you remember, it was a confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders in which Jesus related himself to a shepherd who watches over his sheep. And he cautioned the, against the thieves and the robbers who would come to try and steal away from him and, uh, and would give no, no concern for their harm. These, uh, of course, these thieves and robbers were clearly intended to represent the religious leaders who were trying by means of intimidation uh, and fear to steal away the people from truth. Uh, They were trying to rob the kingdom of their souls so that they could gain honor for themselves with no regard for the sheep. And so they were illegitimate pretenders. They were indeed, as Jesus describes them, thieves thieves. 
and robbers. Jesus, however, is the good shepherd uh, who lays down his life for the benefit of the sheep, dying instead of them, rescuing them from eternal life, imparting life forever to the sheep who recognize his voice, the, 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 those that the Father has given to the Son from every tribe, tongue, and nation across the earth. Well, this morning, we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 10 with verse 22. Now, two months have passed, all right? Two months have passed uh, between since the Feast of Tabernacles and the text that we read about last week. But the tensions between Jesus and the, these religious leaders have not tempered with time. Uh, this, I'm going, to call, I'm going to tell you, this is a very stout portion of Scripture. Uh, John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42, is a very stout portion. Have you ever heard someone say before, I just don't think the pulpit is a place for doctrine, it's the place for whatever? Uh, too, we, we hear too much doctrine from the, the pulpit. Uh, I actually had a pastor at the church I pastored, it might actually be my first pastor, I had a guy tell me one time, he said, Pastor, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the study that you put in the Word, but I just feel like you use a little too much Scripture sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, thank you, I appreciate that. But uh, the fact is, you can't teach and preach the Gospel without laying a foundation of biblical doctrine from the Scriptures. And so we have to have, obviously, doctrine. Now, much of that doctrine that we get as we study the Scriptures is drawn from the epi epistles, from the apostles, as they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But this morning, this morning we're going to get a, do a doctrinal message from the red letters. Uh, we're going to get a doctrinal message from Jesus as he lays down some very heavy theological principles. Uh, he's going to address some issues that we need to have clarity on from the scriptures. He's going to address issues like election, efficacious grace, uh, expectations from his followers, and eternal security. Uh, this is not the theology according to Luther, Wesley, Calvin, MacArthur, or Augustine. This is theology according to Jesus. So lock the doors, all right? Buckle your seatbelts, and let's look at our text this morning. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. It says, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles ended on October 19th. Uh, and the Feast of Dedication began on December 20th. So like I said, two months have passed. The Feast of Dedication you probably recognize it's re referred often to Hanukkah. Uh, we call the Feast of Dedication Hanukkah, or sometimes it's referred to as the Feast of Lights. It's an eight-day non-mosaic festival. Perhaps you've wondered what Hanukkah was. Well, this morning I'm going to try to explain it to you. It's an eight-day non-mosaic festival. Now, here's what I mean by non-mosaic. In other words, it's a festival that's not prescribed in the Mosaic Law. Okay, so it's a, it's a festival of the people of Israel. It's not part of the Mosaic Law. It's one that showed up later during the intertestamental period. And it was established to commemorate the Maccabean Revolt. I'm good now. So we're going to transition from this to this. And we can still hear me. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Amen, amen, amen. Uh, so it's a, established to commemorate the Maccabean Revolt. Now, when the, now here's what that is. When the, let me just kind of give you a little bit of history. When the military forces of a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, it was a Greek, uh, who invaded, came in and invaded Jerusalem in 168 B.C., they invaded the temple. All right, so I want you to think about this, the significance of what's happened. It's 168 B.C., 168 years before Christ, and a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes comes into Jerusalem and he invades the city with his Greek armies and they go into the temple. Now when they go into the temple, they go in there and they make it a site for pagan worship. And they take a pig's head. Now if you, if you, you know the, 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 the history of, of, of the Jews and, and pork, and they take a pig's head and they put it on, a, on, a, on, a, on an altar in the temple. And so the Jews referred to this as what is called, as, as for them, the abomination of desecration. 
And this occurred in 168 B.C. Well, a group of Jewish zealots called the Maccabees rose up. We read about them in, uh, in the apocryphal books, those books that are not, not uh, uh, part of the canon of Scripture, but they're nevertheless good historical writings that are included, these apocryphal writings that were written during that 400-year between Malachi and Matthew. And so we read about this, that these Maccabees rose up, rose up and they were led by two men, uh, Matthias and his son Joseph Maccabeus. That's where they get the name, the Maccabees. And these men and these Maccabees, these rebels, were successful in leading a revolt. And so when they did, when they took Jerusalem back, they ordered the cleansing and the rededication of the temple because the temple had been defiled. And so they ordered this cleansing. Well, in order to do this, a new altar was set up and it was dedicated on December 25th. It was said that during the purification of the temple, during this eight-day time of purification, that the lights continued to burn in the temple for eight days. Now, here's the significance of that. There wasn't enough oil to sustain the flame and the candles and the, bur- and the altar for eight days. And yet, the candles, the lights, the fire continued to burn. So the purification of the temple, God, in other words, God provided this flame of purification. It wasn't dependent upon the physical presence of the oil. God provided his own oil. And he gave his own flame to provide and to give purification to the temple. And so it was said that during that purification, they continued to burn and purified that temple Uh, from its desecration. So from then on, the Jews celebrated every year for eight days, beginning on that particular date. So now you know, when you hear about Hanukkah around this time, you'll know exactly what Hanukkah is all about. Um, This was, this particular occasion that occurred during that eight days of purification or the, the taking over by the Maccabees and it's recapturing Israel, Jerusalem, was a tremendous military victory. It'd be kind of like for us, it'd be kind of like D Day. You know, for the United States, we celebrate D-Day because the storming of the, of, the, of the shores was a massive military victory. And so for now for, you know, 80 years, we've been celebrating D-Day because it's a, it's a huge military victory for us. But for the Jews, this was more than just a military victory. This was a divine act of deliverance for the people of God, the chosen people of God. So, you can imagine, as as we come into this this time in Scripture, in John chapter 10, verse 20, you can imagine the fever pitch that developed during the festival of lights as the people gathered in Jerusalem. A people, now you've got to remember, this is a people who are very proud of their heritage, very proud of their nation, and they're under now, back under dominion from another foreign land, the Romans. And so you can imagine when he comes up to this celebration of the Feast of Lights, you can imagine all the memories that go back to what happened in, 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 at, with the Maccabees and how, well, God can do it again because now they're living under Roman dominion. Well, God had given them deliverance before. Surely, surely, surely he can do it and will do it. Again, every year, surely he'll do it again. So when John begins this section by telling us that it was the feast of dedication we can expect that he's cluing us in to the growing hype for a messianic appearance. These people are looking for a Messiah. The problem, of course, is that the Messiah who arrives is not the military leader that they're expecting. This isn't Joseph and Matthias Maccabeus, military heroes for a temporary deliverance for a deliverance that's going to sit on one spot in the chronological line. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the good shepherd who will lay down his life for his sheep. He's the Christ of the prophets, but he is not the Christ of Jewish expectation. So John continues setting the scene for us. Verse 22 goes on. He says, it's winter. 
And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Now, let's understand, the colonnade of Solomon is also referred to what we call the Solomon's porch. So if you've ever done any study of the temple, you'll see the Solomon's colonnade is, is what's referred to as Solomon's porch. It's that covered colonnade that ran along the eastern wall of the temple. And so John has placed us right here at the end of December, and the cold, rainy season has arrived in Jerusalem. So I want you to kind of put yourself in this place as we, kind of, as we begin to walk through this text. I want you to imagine what it was like in the scene of what it looks like so that we can picture in this cold, rainy section, we can see Jesus walking under the porch. And why is he walking under the porch? It's raining, most likely, and so he's walking under the porch to stay out of the rain, the light of the world flickering in the temple. Verse 24, so the Jews gathered around him and they said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, then tell us plainly, as if he hasn't already. But these religious leaders continue to question him. They continue to press him. They continue to antagonize him. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Now, aside from the lashing that these thieves and robbers received just two, two months ago, the verbal whipping that Jesus gave them in declaring himself to be the good shepherd, not to mention his earlier proclamation of being the living water and the light of the world, aside from these very clear statements he had given of his divine nature, John has pointed us to his miracles. The signs that gave testimony to his divinity. Now, let's make sure we, we remember what we're talking about when we talk about the use of the signs that John has used. A sign is simply a symbol pointing to something to be signified. The miracles are signs pointing to the unusual character of the one who is performing them. These are the works that he's referring to. These are the works he's referring to that he has done in the Father's name. Now, John tells us seven of them. Do you remember what they are? Started out with, started out with the changing of the water into wine at Cana. And then he went from, the, from that to the healing, the nobleman's son, showing his power over sickness and sin. And then he healed the, blame, bl the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, who like who like all of us are spiritually lame, unable to come to Jesus, yet Jesus acts in grace to call them to himself in spite of ability. Then he fed 5,000 people. Likely 15,000 men and women who were present on that day. And he did it, if you remember, do you remember that story? He did it with two sardines and five Cheez-Its. Do you remember that? Revealing himself to be the only one, the one who alone can satisfy the hunger of the human soul. And then he walked on water, showing the elements of nature remain under his command. And then he healed the blind man who had been born blind. And then he raised Lazarus, which we're going to see in the section that follows today's text. Each of these, now you think about that, that's seven Signs. Now at this point, except for Lazarus being raised, at least six that John tells us about point to and signify and should be convincing in and of themselves. But these religious leaders refuse to believe. And then he tells them why they don't believe in him. Verse 26. But you do not believe, look, because you are not among my sheep. Jesus says very plainly, you don't believe because you aren't the Father's sheep. The Father's sheep are those that the Father has given to the Son, those who hear the shepherd's voice and come to rest in the safety and the provision of his fold. These religious leaders, the men who were wearing the cloak of a shepherd, men who were supposed to be the model for other sheep to follow, they weren't even sheep themselves. And the reason was their refusal to believe in such a way that compelled them to follow him. They saw the signs. They heard his teachings. 
but they refused to listen. They refused to accept the meaning of the signs that should have convinced them of his divinity. And this is why they, re- listen, this is why they remain in their sin. They remain as outsiders to the flock of God's fold. And for this, now listen, they are fully responsible. They bear the responsibility for their rejection of what Christ has shown them and told them. Here we have in these two verses the first of a very significant theological issue. Because in these two verses, verses 25 and 26, we see both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man resting together as parallel truths. In verse 25, the miracles of Jesus have made it plain to them that he is divine at least enough so that they should be drawn to know more of him. But in the face of this clarity, they have categorically chosen for themselves to reject the evidence of who he is. Do you remember when Paul walks through his theological tome, the book of Romans in chapter 1? And he says, the people saw all these wonderful attributes of God, but they chose the creation rather than the creator, and they brought upon themselves the due penalty of their sins. They chose to remain in their blindness. This is what, this is what Jesus says in verse 25, these Pharisees have done. And in verse 26, God remains sovereign in choosing his own sheep. He does not, and listen, this is important for us to recognize and understand. He does not abdicate, he does not yield, neither does he forfeit his sovereignty in any situation, including every aspect of our salvation. If God is not sovereign in everything, he is not sovereign. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Ephesians 1, 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy 2, 13, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And this is what happens among the sheep that God has called to himself. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. Look, they follow me. Three things he says here. First of all, he says they hear his voice calling to them. He knows them. To know them is not just to know who they are. He knows them with an intimate knowledge. And they follow him. And then in the next verse is read, needs to be read in response to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. And then look at verse 28 because this is the response. He says, I give them eternal life and they'll never perish and no one, no one, no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My sheep, now look, verses 27 and 28 need to be read together, all right? So let's read the three. Number one, my sheep hear my voice and I give them eternal life, divine life, and that is given to us by God. Number two, I know them and they'll never perish. Number three, they follow me and no one will ever be able to take them away from me. The grace of God. Now listen, we said this a few weeks back. And we need to wrap our minds around this. The grace of God is efficacious to his purposes. Now here's what we mean by that. The grace of God is efficacious to his purposes. In other words, the work of God's grace, listen, the work of God's grace will always result in what God has promised he will do. Do you get that? The grace of God is not only enough to cover your sin, it's enough always to accomplish his purposes and his promises. We read that and talked about efficacious grace in John when we were in chapter 6. 
Jesus said, all, now listen, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. You see, Jesus will never reject those whom the Father has given them. He will save them and he will keep them. And those who believe in him for salvation, he will never turn away and he'll preserve them into eternity. So I have to ask the question, can you lose your salvation? Now I'm going to be honest with you, until I was about 22 years old, I was absolutely 100% convinced that salvation was a give and take. It was a come and go. I got saved every week for the first time. Because I believed and was taught that I could lose my salvation. So I ask you, you Baptist you, can you lose your salvation? Let's put it a different way. Can you lose by a work that, by a work that which you could not earn by your efforts? Let me first say it again. Can you lose by a work that which you could not earn by your own efforts. Can you lose what God did and overrule the will of God? You see, if salvation is earned by works, then yes. If salvation is earned because I, it was upon me to choose him, yes. Because I change my mind all the time. I tried on three sweaters this morning <laughs> before I arrived at this one. I change my mind all the time. And if my salvation is dependent upon my choosing Him, it's not secure. If it is Christ plus my efforts, my obedience, my abstinence, then yes, you can lose your salvation. But look at verse 28 again. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them away from my protection. Can you lose your salvation? Absolutely not. Your salvation is secure because it is utterly dependent upon the protection of the shepherd. And he says, no one will ever snatch them from my hand. But, <laughs> notice in verse 27, what do God's sheep, those who possess this salvation with security, what is it that they do? They follow me. They follow me. There's an active responsiveness of the will when you come to Christ in salvation. When you believe in Christ, you grieve the sin that has separated you from God, and you repent, and you turn from that sin, and then what? You follow Christ. Can you get saved? Pray a prayer, walk an aisle, fill out a card, get dunked in the water and go on your merry way and be just like you always were before? No. Your salvation is called into deep question because Jesus' sheep follow him. Romans 8, 29. Listen, for those whom he foreknew... He also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. It is God's intentional purpose for you and I to begin to look like Jesus more and more every day of our salvation. In other words, God didn't simply elect you to be saved. He called you out of your sin to act and behave like Jesus. And he holds you secure. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. In other words, I have them in my hand, and the Father has them in his. One pastor related this to 
a vice president defending his actions is being done under the authority of the president. Jesus says, I'm only doing, I'm doing what the Father's told me to do. Jesus saves who the Father gives, and there is absolutely no one who can challenge this. Why? Why? Because God is greater. Romans 8 goes on. It says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? You see, the answer to that is no one. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else. In other words, if I haven't named it already, nothing else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. To God be the glory. So what the Father has given to the Son, now listen, remains the possession of the Father and is now in possession of both. Verse 30, I and the Father are one. In other words, there's no disagreement between us. I'm doing what he has told me to do. There is absolute complicity, absolute cooperation. They are one in nature, one in mind, one in purpose. Is there, now listen, is there any chance that the day might come that we have called out to Christ, we have followed him, he has been our shepherd. Is there any chance that the day will come when we enter into heaven and the Father will reject those that the Son saves? None whatsoever. Because they are identical in purpose and intent. He says, I and the Father are one. Look at verse 31, because that really hit the spot. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Now, a second time, these men have become so enraged by his claims of divinity that they begin to dig up the ground. Now listen, they're in the temple. They're not out in the field. They're in the temple with stone grounds. And these men are so enraged, they're so angry by what he has just said that they begin to dig up the ground of this marble to collect weapons to throw at him. Imagine the scene, the fever, their hatred has been simmering for 30 verses and now they've reached a boil. Imagine the anger, the hatred as they fall into this dirt and they begin digging with their bare hands in the marble of the temple to find stones to hurl at him. If he isn't who he says he is, they're absolutely justified. If Jesus isn't who he says he is, they are absolutely justified in their actions. If he isn't really the second person of the triune God, then Jesus is a heretic and he's a blasphemer. The law of God condemns him and they are justified in his execution. Now, let's think logically. If Jesus is lying... If, he has, if he's a fraud, if he's fabricated his story here, what do you think his next words are going to be? Now, I want you to picture these guys. They're down. They're, they're mad. They're angry. They're beside themselves. They're feverishly digging up for stones. If Jesus is a fraud and he's pretending, what do you think his next words are going to be? He, he's getting ready to die. They're getting ready to throw stones at him. What do you think his next words are going to be? Except for one other occasion, it's just been words. It's just been threats. But now they're ready to throw. And if he's lying, oh, that's what he's doing, right? Because it's real now. He's getting ready to die. Verse 32. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? In other words, what kind of work, good or evil, are you trying to stone me for? Tell me which work I've done that makes me anything other than what I am, one with the Father. Instead of stoning him, they should fall down in repentance and they should worship him. Instead, verse 33, 
The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you for blasphemy, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Hey, did Jesus ever con- 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 claim himself to be divine? Did he? That's not rhetorical, did he? Yes, he did. Did Jesus ever claim himself to be divine? Yes, he absolutely did. These men certainly believed he did. So Jesus responds with them by a, cl- a quote from Psalm 28. In Psalm 28, God is condemning an assembly of judges for their unfairness. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? That's from Psalm 28. He refers to them as God's. Verse 35, If he called them God's to whom the word of God came, and scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said I'm the Son of God? His argument is essentially this. This is what it boils down to. Scripture cannot be broken. I mean, he's speaking to religious leaders who have, who have committed their life to these scriptures. Okay, so your confidence is in the scriptures. It can't be broken. It's absolutely indestructible regardless of how people respond to it. It doesn't matter. Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture uses the terms God to describe men. Specifically in Psalm 82 with reference to judges because they represent his divine justice. And then he goes on. This argument says you've never made any protests against that term. You've, I don't, I've never heard you in the synagogue saying, well, we can't read Psalm 82 because, well, he refers to them as gods. You never, you never balked at that one. So you should have no problem with me calling myself the son of God if that's the case. In other words, if he called those judges gods, why do you have a problem with me, the one that he sent into the world, the very Son of God? Verse 37, if I'm doing the works of my Father, if I'm, or rather, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, look, he makes it very, don't blame in me. If I'm, not, if I'm not behaving and doing what God, what the Father has, has committed me, don't believe in me. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I'm in the Father. You see, the problem was not his claim to divinity. It was their failure to recognize him as divine. So he points them to his works. If his works are not what God would do, then they were right to not believe him. But if his works are the works of God, then the works were a witness to who he was. So what kind, let's think about it for just a minute. Everybody tune in with me here. What what kind of works would have to be done to show these men that he's divine? What's Jesus got to do? Creation. Did it. Heal the sick. Did it. Heal the lame. Did it. Feed a multitude with scraps. Did it. Walk on water, did it. Heal a man of a congenital condition, did it. Raise a dead man, gonna do it. But even against such compelling evidence, look at verse 39. Again, they sought to arrest him. But he escaped from their hands. Why did he escape from their hands? It's because he's such a slick little guy. No, it's because they weren't in charge of his life. They weren't in charge of the timing or the occasion of his death. He was always in charge. Always. So once again, Jesus escaped them and he went to find ears that would hear. Verse 40. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. Look, many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And then John says it again, verse 42, many believed in him there. Verse 42 is the conclusion of Jesus' ministry on earth, according to the Gospel of John. That's where it ends. So what are we going to do with this text? Let me summarize. I'm going to make it very simple. It's a very heavy, deep, hard text. Let me summarize it in three statements, very simply put. Number one, 
Salvation is entirely conferred under the divine call of God. Number two. The grace of God will always accomplish the purposes of God. And number three. Though, now listen, this is important. Those who are truly, pay attention to that word truly. Those who are truly the sheep of God will remain eternally secure in the promises of God. So here's my question. How can we know that we are truly God's sheep? How do I know? From a text that is ripe in theological depth, the answer to that question It's really very simple. You see, I don't have to have a doctrine of pneumatology in order to know if I'm a child of God. I don't have to have an understanding of the doctrine of whateverology. I don't have to know all the intricate natures of all the things. How can I know that I'm a true sheep of God? Very, very simply put. His sheep hear his voice calling to them, and they follow him. Amen? We began our time together this morning with the lighting of the second candle. And our attention was directed to the promises of God that have been kept for us. Promises of peace and rest for the people of God. Promise of the coming Messiah fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. As we saw from our text this morning, the Israelites were expecting the Messiah to be a savior who would rescue them from the Romans and restore Israel to its former national glory. But the promises of peace and rest, this this is important for us to wrap our minds around because a lot of our Christmas carols sometimes get this wrong. The promises of peace and rest were never intended to be fulfilled in this world. In fact, rather than bringing peace, Jesus, the promised Messiah, brought division. And this was all to accomplish the merciful will of God for our salvation. On the night that he was betrayed, on the evening just before his crucifixion, crucifixion, Jesus made a wonderful promise. He said, I have, now listen, he said, I have said these things to you that in me, in me, you may have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. Is that a true statement? In the world, you will have tribulation. You will not have your best life now. You will have tribulation. You know what it says after? I have overcome the world. Amen. To God be the glory. Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't have the peace that is found in Jesus, your peace is a fleeting fancy. It will come and go with the emotional whim of your choosing. But if you'll listen to the voice of God calling and follow him he'll give you a peace that you'll never understand can you testify to that this morning look around this is the testimony of those who have placed their faith and received the peace that Christ has given today is the day to receive the peace of God He alone is the great shepherd, the good shepherd. He laid down his life for his sheep. Listen to his voice calling you today. Come into his fold. Place your faith in him. Trust him and him alone. And let today be the day of your peace. Let's bow our heads and pray about that. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. 
If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.